Chapter 1 The Wizard of Molokai Kalamaki was the Wizard of Molokai. He could see into the future with the help of evil spirits. Everyone in the Kingdom of Hawaii went to ask for his advice, and everyone was afraid of him. His enemies died in terrible ways. At night, he was seen in the high mountains, moving from one mountain to the other. He was also seen walking in the forest with his head high above the tall trees. Kalamaki looked strange. His skin was whiter than the other people's, his hair was the colour of dry grass, and he was blind. The people of the island said, Blind as Kalamaki who can see the future. Lahua, Kalamaki's daughter, lived with her husband, Kiola, in her father's house. Kiola did not know much about his wife's father, but one thing troubled him. Kalamaki bought everything he wanted and paid with shiny new dollars. The people of the island said, Shiny as Kalamaki's dollars. However, he never worked, and no one knew where his shiny new dollars came from. One day, Lahua went to visit a friend on the other side of the island, and the men of the village went fishing. But Kiola was lazy, and he did not go. He sat and watched the sea and the birds flying in the blue sky. He thought about Kalamaki's shiny dollars, and decided to find out where he hid his money. He remembered that late at night when everyone was in bed, Kalamaki sat at his desk and looked at books. Then he could hear the sound of the drawer opening and closing slowly. That's where he probably hides his money, thought Kiola. He went to the desk drawer and looked at it for a moment. Then he opened it and saw Kalamaki's shiny dollars. Ha! I was right, thought Kiola, closing the drawer. The next day, the ship which came once a month with a lot of special things to eat and drink arrived in Molokai. Kiola stood in front of the house and watched the ship coming into the bay. If he can pay for those special things today, then he's certainly a wizard, and the dollars come from the devil, Kiola thought. While he was thinking, Kalamaki came and stood behind him. The old wizard was worried. Is that the ship? He asked. Yes, answered Kiola. It'll be here soon. Well, said Kalamaki seriously. Then I must tell you my secret, Kiola. Come into the house. So they went into the elegant living room. There was a shelf with a lot of books, a Bible on the table, and pictures on the walls. It was the living room of a rich man. Close the windows while I lock all the doors, said Kalamaki. He opened the desk drawer and took out some necklaces and some leaves from trees. Now I'm going to do something magic, said Kalamaki. He put the Bible under the sofa and got a mat. He put the leaves on some sand in a little pan. Then he and Kiola put on the necklaces and sat on opposite sides of the mat. Don't be afraid said the wizard, lighting the leaves and saying strange words. The smoke and the strange words confused Kiola. Suddenly, the mat and the living room disappeared. A moment later, Kiola and the wizard were on the same mat, on a beach near the sea, under the hot sun. Kiola was very surprised and did not know what to say. What's happening? cried Kiola. Why are we on this beach and not in our living room? Don't worry, said Kalamaki. Now we're here. Where are we? cried Kiola. That's not important, said Kalamaki.
were here now, and that's the important thing. Go to the woods and bring me a lot of these special leaves. Be quick. We must be home before the ship arrives. Keola got up from the mat and started walking on the beach of bright sand and shiny shells. Why don't I know this beach? Keola thought, looking around. This place doesn't look like Hawaii. One day I'll come back here and take these beautiful shells. He soon found the special leaves he was looking for in the woods near the beach. As he walked towards the trees, he saw a young woman with nothing on her body but some leaves. When she heard him walking, she was very frightened, and looked around. But strangely, she did not look at Keola. Good afternoon," he said. "Please don't be frightened." The young woman ran into the woods, and he followed her. He saw other people running away, and decided to go back to Kalamaki with the special leaves. Keola told the wizard about his adventure in the woods. All this is like a dream," said Kalamaki. "I don't think anyone saw me." Said Keola, and no one did, because we're invisible, thanks to my magic. Said the wizard, but they can hear us, so we must speak softly. Kalamaki picked up some stones and made a circle around the mat. He put some leaves in the middle. Now you must burn these leaves on the fire, Kalamaki said. While the leaves are burning, I'll do my magic. Before the leaves become black, the same magic that brought us here will take us back home. Be careful and call me before the fire dies. I don't want to be left on this beach. As soon as the leaves started burning. The wizard jumped out of the circle and began running on the beach and picking up shells. It seemed to Keola that the shells shone as he took them. When Keola put the last leaves on the fire, he cried, "Come back, Kalamaki! Come back! The leaves are almost burnt." Kalamaki ran back very fast and jumped on the mat. As soon as he jumped on the mat, the fire died and the beach disappeared. In a moment, they were suddenly back in the living room, and there were a lot of shiny dollars on the mat. Keola opened the windows and saw the ship in the bay. Chapter Two: The Sea of the Dead. That same night, Kalamaki put five dollars in Keola's hand. Keola, he said. If you're a clever man, you'll forget what you saw this afternoon. It was only a dream. Remember, only a dream. Keola never said anything about this adventure, but he thought about it all the time, and he became lazy. Why do I have to work when my father-in-law can make dollars from shells? He thought. He bought expensive clothes with the five dollars, but then he was sorry. Why didn't I buy a concertina with that money? He thought. I could play it all day long. Keola was angry with Kalamaki. That man can take dollars from the beach, and I don't have any money for a concertina. He thought. That night he spoke to his wife Lahua and complained about Kalamaki. He told her about their adventure on the beach. My father's a dangerous man when he gets angry," said Lahua. "You know what happened to his enemies? They all died in a terrible way. You're a baby in my father's hands. Be careful, Keola." Keola was afraid of Kalamaki, but his wife's words made him angry. "You're wrong, Lahua!" he shouted and went to Kalamaki. Kalamaki," he said. "I want a concertina." Really," 
said Kalamaki. Yes, said Kiola. You take dollars from the beach, so you certainly have money for a concertina. You're a brave man, Kiola, said Kalamaki. I thought you were lazy and useless, but you're not. I'm very happy about this. Perhaps you can be my assistant in this difficult business. You'll have the best concertina in Hawaii, and tonight, you and I will go and find money. Are we going back to the beach? Asked Kiola. No, no, said Kalamaki. You must learn more about my secrets. This time, I'll teach you to catch fish. Meet me tonight near Pili's boat, and don't tell anyone about our business. His voice was warm and friendly, and Kiola was happy. Why can't we use your boat tonight? Asked Kiola. Pili's boat is better, and tomorrow, you'll understand why," said Kalamaki. "Very well," said Kiola happily. All a man needs is a little courage," thought Kiola. When he saw Lahua, he wanted to tell her everything. But no," he thought. "I'll wait until I can show her the concertina. Then she'll understand that I'm a clever man." That night, Kalamaki and Kiola took Pili's boat and went out to sea. It was a windy night and the sea was rough. The wizard had a lantern that he held with his finger. He and Kiola talked together like old friends about magic and money. Look," said the wizard. "There is Molokai behind us. This part of the sea is called the Sea of the Dead. It's very deep here, and the bottom of the sea is covered with the bones of men. When a man falls into the sea here, he drowns, and his bones go to the bottom, where the evil spirits live. Kiola was afraid and looked at Kalamaki. By the light of the stars and the lantern, the wizard seemed to change. "What's the matter?" asked Kiola. "Are you ill?" "I'm not ill," said the wizard. But someone here is very ill. Suddenly, Kalamaki's hand started growing, and it became huge. Kiola screamed and covered his face. Kalamaki held up the lantern and said, "Look at my face." His head got bigger and bigger, and he continued growing. Kiola sat in front of him and screamed with terror. And now. Said the wizard, "What do you think about the concertina? Or perhaps you want a flute? Well, I must get out of this little boat now. I'm too big for it." Kalamaki stood up and jumped into the sea, and he continued growing. He stood in the deep sea, and his head and shoulders were like an island. He was huge and frightening. He took Pili's boat in his hand and broke it into pieces, and Kiola fell into the deep, rough sea. I'm taking the lantern with me," said the wizard, "because I must walk a very long way to get to the island. Ah, I can feel the bones under my feet." Kalamaki turned and walked away with big steps. Kiola watched him disappear in the night, holding the lantern above his head. Kiola was terrified and began swimming, but he did not know where he was going. Suddenly, he heard the voices of men on a big ship. "Help!" he cried loudly. "Help!" The men on the ship heard him and pulled him out of the water. They gave him food, water, and dry clothes. He did not want to return to Hawaii because he did not want to see Kalamaki again. So he decided to work on the ship. Listening activity.
One. He isn't very clever. I mean, it was obvious that his father-in-law was going to trick him. Two. She gave her husband good advice. He was wrong not to listen to her. Three. I think he was very lucky that there was a ship passing and he didn't die. Four. The way he pretends to be so nice, but then tricks his son-in-law. That's terrible. Five. I think that he should work more, not just depend on his father-in-law's magic for money. Six. It's difficult to understand why he wants to hurt people so much. What does he get from it? Chapter three. Kiola escapes. There was a lot of good food to eat on the ship, and Kiola became fat. The captain was a kind man, but the mate was not. He was big and strong, and did not like Kiola. He hit him and said unkind things to him every day. Kiola was unhappy about this because he tried to do his work well. He came from a good family, and they treated each other kindly. But worst of all, Kiola could never sleep. When he tried to sleep, the mate always woke him up angrily. After some time, he decided to leave the ship. One beautiful night, the sea was calm, and there were thousands of stars in the sky. Kiola was steering the ship, and he could see a small island with palm trees on it. The captain and the mate saw it too, and looked at it with their telescope. Have you ever been on that island? Asked the mate. No, but I know it. Said the captain. Ships never go there, and no one lives on it. Really? Said the mate. One night I sailed near the island and saw a lot of lights on the beach. Perhaps some people live there. Perhaps. But we won't stop there," said the captain. "We'll just sail by the island." He turned to Kiola and shouted, "Did you hear me, Kiola? Sail by the island, but don't go too close to it." Kiola listened to the captain and the mate as they talked. "This island is perfect for me," he thought. "Ships never go there, so the mate won't find me." And Kalamaki can't possibly come this far. When the captain and the mate went away, he quietly steered very close to the island. The mate suddenly came back and saw that the ship was sailing towards the island. What are you doing? He shouted angrily. You fool! You're steering the ship too close to the island. Kiola quickly jumped from the ship into the black sea and swam towards the island. He was not afraid because the sea was calm and warm, and he had his sailor's knife to fight sharks. The sea pushed him into a big lagoon where he could see thousands of shiny stars. There were palm trees all around him. The next morning, Kiola looked everywhere, but he could not find anyone. He only found some old huts, and he made his home there. He fished and cooked his fish over the fire. He climbed the tall palm trees and got green coconuts. He drank their milk because there was no water on the island. The days were long and the nights were very frightening. He made a lamp from a coconut shell, and in the evening he sat in his hut, lit his lamp, and trembled until morning. Oh, I'm very unhappy and afraid. He often thought. All this time, he lived in his hut near the lagoon and the palms. One day, he went to the beach near the sea, but he did not like the bright sand, the shiny shells, and the hot sun. He looked around and was amazed. How is this possible? He thought. This is like Kalamaki's beach. 
Perhaps white men don't know everything about sailing. We probably sailed in a circle, and I'm near Molokai. Is this the beach where Kalamaki gets his dollars? The thought frightened him, and he decided not to go to the beach again. About a month later, some boats arrived. The people looked friendly and spoke a different language, but many of the words were the same as Hawaiian, so it was easy to understand. The men behaved in a polite way, and the women were friendly. They were very kind to Kiola and built him a new hut. He was surprised because they never sent him to work with the other men. They even gave him a wife. When Kiola realized that his new wife was the same girl he saw on the island the first time, he began to get worried. I've left my home, my wife Lahua, and my friends in Molokai. Kiola thought sadly. I've traveled far to escape from Kalamaki, and now I'm on his magic island. This is terrible. Why didn't I stay in Molokai? Kiola stayed in his hut near the lagoon and never went to the other side of the island. He spoke very little. He did not trust his new friends because they were too kind. After his terrible experience with Kalamaki, he was very careful. He told them nothing about himself, only his name and the name of his islands, the Eight Islands. He also told them about the king's palace in Honolulu. And that he was a friend of the king. Kiola asked the people of the tribe a lot of questions, and learnt a lot of new things. The island where he was living was called the Isle of Voices, and it belonged to the tribe. However, they lived on another island called the Green Island most of the year. It was about three hours away by boat. They had their homes, gardens, chickens, and pigs on the Green Island. They travelled to the Isle of Voices once a year when the fish around the Green Island became poisonous. After Kiola escaped from the ship, the captain and the mate sailed to the Green Island. The mate died there because he ate poisonous fish. The people of the island told him that the fish was poisonous, but he was stupid and did not listen to them. This was good news for Kiola, because he was afraid of the mate. And did not want to see him again. Chapter Four, The Isle of Voices. The people of the tribe told Kiola about the Isle of Voices. The island got its name from the invisible devils that lived on the beach near the sea. These invisible devils talked to each other in strange languages. Little fires appeared and disappeared on the beach day and night, but no one understood why. Kiola was very surprised to hear this. Does this happen on the Green Island too? Asked Kiola. No, never. Answered one man. It never happens on any other island, only here. But you mustn't worry, because the devils live on the beach near the sea, and not at the lagoon. Remember, the devils won't hurt you if you leave them alone. Kiola knew he was safe at the lagoon, but he wanted to do something about the devils. One day, he went to speak to the chief of the tribe. There was an island that had problems with invisible devils. Kiola told the chief, and the people solved it. How did they do that? Asked the chief. There was a tree growing in the woods. That had magic leaves, he said, and the devils came to get the leaves. So the people of the island cut it down, and the devils went away. What kind of tree was it? Asked the chief. Kiola showed him the tree with the magic leaves that Kalamaki used. The chief and other men seemed interested in his plan. Every night, the chief and the old men of the tribe talked about his plan. But the chief was afraid. Remember," said the chief to the other men. A chief once threw his spear at one of the voices, and that night he fell out of a palm tree, and was killed.
the men decided to forget Kiola's plan. Kiola began to feel happy with his new life and the things around him. He was kind to his wife, and she loved him very much. But one day he came home and found her on the floor crying. What's the matter, dear? said Kiola softly. Oh, it's nothing, Kiola, she said, crying. The same night she woke him up, and by the low light of the lamp, Kiola could see her sad face. Kiola, she said softly, come very close to me, because I must whisper. No one must hear us. Kiola moved closer to her, and she continued. Two days before we leave the island, go and stay in the woods. We'll choose the place and hide food there. Every night I'll come to the secret place and I'll sing. If you don't hear me singing, it means that we are no longer on the island. Then you can come out of the woods safely. Keola was confused and frightened when he heard this. What's happening? he cried. I can't live among the devils. I don't want to stay on this island alone. I want to leave it. My poor Keola, said the girl sadly. You'll never leave this island alive. You see, my people are cannibals. They eat men. They have always eaten men. But this is a secret. They'll eat you before we leave. Oh, my poor Keola. I love you very much, but I can't take you to the Green Island. Keola was terrified. Every part of his body trembled. He knew about cannibals in the South Sea Islands, and this always frightened him. He heard from travellers that cannibals took good care of the man they wanted to eat. Now he understood why he had a new hut, a wife, and lots of good food, and he never worked. He lay on his bed and thought about his terrible future. The next day the people of the tribe were kind and friendly as they always were. They spoke politely and made beautiful poetry, and they told funny stories at meals. But Keola did not care about this. All he could see were the white teeth in their mouths, and he felt sick. When they finished eating, he went to his hut and lay down like a dead man. The next day everything was the same. His wife followed him. Keola, she said, you must eat or you'll be killed and cooked tomorrow. The old chiefs say you're ill and you'll get thin. Keola got up and looked at his wife. I don't care, he said angrily. If I must die, I'll die the quickest way. Let the devils eat me, and not the men. Goodbye. He turned around and started walking to the other side of the island. Listening Activity 1. He's very frightened when he finds out about the custom of his wife's people. But it's not surprising, is it? Two. She betrays her people because she loves her husband, but I think I'd do the same for love. 3. Their custom seems terrible to us nowadays, but at that time, for a society that didn't have a lot to eat, perhaps it was the only way they could survive. 4. He seems to forget about his first wife quite easily. I feel sorry for her. 5. They're so nice to him, but they know that they're going to kill him. I don't understand how they can be like that. 6. He accepts that he's going to die, whatever he does, but I think that the right thing to do was to stay with the tribe and try to persuade them not to kill him. Chapter 5 The Battle with the Invisible Enemy The sun was hot on the other side of the island, and there were no people. 
but there were footprints on the sand, and Kiola could hear voices and whispers everywhere. Little fires appeared and disappeared all over the beach. All the languages of the world were spoken on that beach. French, Dutch, Russian, Chinese, and many others. Devils and wizards from all parts of the world whispered to each other. The beach was very crowded, but Kiola could see no one, and he was not afraid any more. When the fires appeared, he jumped on them. Strange voices called, and invisible hands threw sand on the fires, and they were gone before he could reach them. I'm lucky that Kalamaki is not here. He thought. I know he wants to kill me. He sat down near the woods because he was tired. The beach in front of him was alive with voices and fires. The shells disappeared, and new ones appeared as he sat there. The last time I was here with Kalamaki, the beach was quiet. Thought Kiola. Today there are hundreds of wizards and devils taking millions of dollars and flying high in the air. He was dizzy and confused. Now I know that all the money in the world is made here, on this beach. Kiola thought. Soon Kiola was asleep, and he forgot the island and his many problems. Early the next morning, a noise woke him up, and he was afraid. Perhaps the tribe's looking for me. He thought immediately, but it was not the tribe. On the beach, the voices called and shouted, and they passed in front of him. What's this? Thought Kiola. Something strange is happening, because there are no fires, and the shells are not disappearing. But the invisible voices continue talking, and their voices are angry. He looked around. They're not angry at me. Thought Kiola, because they pass in front of me. Kiola started running with the voices. He ran from one part of the island to the other. He remembered that the wizard's favorite trees grew together in one part of the woods. At that place, there was a great noise of screaming men. Soon, he could hear the noise of axes and loud screaming voices. Perhaps the chief has decided to cut down the magic trees. He thought, and now the wizards and the devils are angry and are trying to defend their trees. He wanted to see what was happening. He walked across the beach, got to the woods, and stopped. He was amazed. He saw one tree fall, and then others started falling. The men of the tribe were there fighting, and bodies lay on the ground covered with blood. Fear was on their faces as they fought and screamed. What a strange battle! Thought Kiola. The cannibals were fighting bravely, but Kiola did not see the enemy. They raised their axes high in the air and then hit something invisible. And here and there, Kiola saw an axe without hands kill a man of the tribe, as his spirit ran away screaming. Kiola looked at this terrible battle for some time, but then it frightened him too much, and he wanted to run away. Suddenly, the high chief of the tribe saw him and called his name. The whole tribe looked at him, and he saw their white teeth. I must run away from here," thought Kiola, running out of the woods and down to the beach. He was terrified and did not care where he was going. "Kiola," said a voice on the beach. "Lehua," he cried. "Is that you?" He looked everywhere for her. But could not see her; she was invisible. I saw you running before. The voice said, "I called you, but you didn't hear me. Quick, go and get the leaves, and we'll be free." Are you there? Asked Kiola, with the mat. Yes, I'm here at your side, and I have the mat. She said, and he felt her arms around him. Oh, Kiola, be quick! Get the leaves before my father gets back. Chapter six. Back in Molokai, Kiola was glad that Lahua was near him. He knew he had to get the wizard's leaves, and there was little time. But he was afraid, very afraid. 
He thought about the battle in the woods and knew it was dangerous to be there. I must be brave and go, he thought. Lahua is waiting for me. He ran back to the woods, got the leaves and returned to Lahua. She helped him put his feet on the mat and then she made the fire. As it was burning, Keola heard the noise of the battle in the woods. The wizards and the cannibals were fighting desperately and screaming. It was a long, terrible battle. And all this time Keola stood there and listened and trembled. He watched as Lehua's invisible hands put the leaves in the fire. She worked quickly. The flames grew high and almost burnt his hands. When the last leaf was burnt, Keola and Lehua were at home again on their island, Molokai. Keola was very happy when he could finally see his wife, Lahua, and he was pleased to be home again in Molokai, in front of a good bowl of poi. There was no poi on the ship or on the Isle of Voices. But most of all, he was happy because he escaped from the cannibals. However, Keola and Lahua were worried about another problem, and they talked about it all night. Kalamaki was still on the Isle of Voices. If Kalamaki stays on the Isle of Voices, we're safe and we can live happily, said Keola. But if he returns to Molokai, we're both in great danger. Remember, my father is a wizard and can grow big and he can walk in the deep sea, said Lahua. I know, said Keola. But the Isle of Voices is far away. It's in the dangerous archipelago. Let's find it on a map. Good idea, said Lahua. There are some old maps in the living room. There's probably a map of Hawaii and the dangerous archipelago among them. He went to the bookshelf in the living room and got down some old maps. After a while, they found one of Hawaii. Lahua soon found where the island was. It's a long way for an old man to walk, said Keola. Yes, it is, said Lahua. But don't forget my father's a wizard. Keola thought for a moment and said, Let's go and talk to a white missionary. Perhaps he can help us. A white missionary? asked Lahua, confused. Perhaps he can help us, said Keola. Missionaries know a lot of things. Keola found a white missionary and told him the long story. The missionary was a clever man and listened carefully to Keola. You married a second wife while you were on the Isle of Voices, said the missionary. That's wrong, very wrong. Keola did not know what to say. All the other things you've told me are confusing and mysterious, said the missionary. And I really don't understand them. Keola and Lahua looked at each other. However, said the missionary, if Kalamake made money in a dishonest way, give some of it to the poor people of the island. You can also give some to the missionaries. Your adventure on the Isle of Voices is very strange, and you mustn't tell anyone about it. It's your secret. But the missionary went to the police in Honolulu. Be careful, he told them, because Kalamake and Keola made counterfeit money while they were on the Isle of Voices. Keep an eye on them. Keola and Lahua listened to the missionary and gave a lot of dollars to the poor people of the island and to the missionaries. They were lucky because they did not see Kalamake again. Was he killed during the battle? Or is he still living on the Isle of Voices? No one knows. The Beach of Faliza Chapter 1 The Marriage The first time I saw the island, it was dawn, and the moon was still in the sky. There's Faliza, Mr. Wilshire, said the captain. Your store is there. I asked the captain for his telescope and looked at the brown roofs of the houses, 
the green woods, and the white beach. Can you see your house, the white one with the big veranda? Asked the captain. When old Adam saw it the first time, he liked it. Poor old Adams! When I came back to this island, he was dead. What happened to him? I asked. He died suddenly one night, said the captain. How did he die? I asked. Some kind of illness, perhaps something on this island, said the captain. I don't know. The last man at the store was Vigors. He left Fariza because he was afraid of the traders, Case and Black Jack. People say bad things about them. And then there's old Captain Randall, who came here long ago. Look, there's a boat coming now. I said to the captain. Yes, said the captain. That's Case and his friend Black Jack. The boat came closer to our ship, and the two men got on. I was happy to meet them. Case was a small man with blue eyes. He spoke well and probably came from a good family. He seemed helpful and friendly. We sat in the captain's cabin and had a drink. Case talked a lot, and I knew he was a good trader, but I did not know he was a dangerous man. We finally got to Faliza at noon. As we walked on the island, Case said, "Well, Wiltshire, you need a wife." "Oh yes," I said. "I almost forgot." There was a crowd of native girls around us. She is pretty," said Case, pointing to a young girl. "Yes. Who is she?" I asked. "She is Uma," said Case, and he called her and spoke to her in her native language. I did not understand what he was saying. She had a pretty face and body and a lovely smile, but she only smiled at me once. I liked her. I think you can have her," said Case. "I'll talk to her mother and then bring her to Captain Randall's house for the marriage." I did not like the idea of marriage, and I told Case that. "Oh, don't worry," he said, smiling. "Black Jack is the priest." We walked to Captain Randall's house. It was an old, dirty house with a small, broken veranda. There was a store in front with scales, a box of tins, a big box of bread, and many bottles and guns. I'll do very well on this island, I thought, because my store has better things. The old captain was in the back room of the house, sitting on the floor, and he was drunk. There were flies all over him. He was a man of seventy who once commanded a big ship in the British Navy. Now he looked terrible. He tried to get up, but he could not move. Captain's a bit drunk this morning," said Case to me. He turned to Captain Randall and said, "There's going to be a marriage, Captain." "What?" asked the old man. "Mr. Wiltshire is going to marry Uma," said Case. "Uma," he said, surprised. But why does he want Uma? Be quiet, Captain," said Case. Case went to arrange the marriage and left me alone with the old captain. I listened to the old man talk and watched him drink. That afternoon, an old native woman with tattoos on her face came into the room. Her eyes were big and dark, and she was singing a strange song. "Who's this?" I asked. It's Farwell, Uma's mother," said Randall. "Aren't you afraid of her?" "Me? Afraid?" cried Randall. "I don't want her to come here, but Uma is getting married today." Farwell suddenly stopped singing and left the house. It was already late in the evening when Case came back with Uma. She was wearing necklaces made of flowers. And she had a red flower in her black hair. She was very serious and quiet. I did not like what I was doing because it was wrong. Black Jack married us and gave Uma a marriage certificate. This 
is what the certificate said. Uma, daughter of Farval of Faleza, is illegally married to Mr. John Wiltshire for one night. Mr. Wiltshire is free to send her home the next morning. Jack Blackmore, priest. After the marriage, Case said, Well, Wiltshire, it's time for you and Uma to go home. He wanted us to leave quickly. Uma and I walked to our new home. When we went in, she smiled gently and said, Me, your wife. Her dark eyes were lively and beautiful, and I was happy she was there. I got up very early the next morning and went out on the veranda. Many young men and children were sitting outside my house. What are they doing here? I thought. What do they want? More people came and sat outside my house. They said nothing and stared. I went inside and said, uh, Uma, what do these natives want? You no know, no, she said. By evening, the natives were tired of staring at my house and went away. The next day, I cleaned the store and put everything in order. I think I'll make a lot of money here, I thought. I dreamt of making money and going back to England to open a pub one day. However, something strange happened. Not one person came to my store. At about three in the afternoon, a white man came to see me. He was dressed like a priest, but his clothes were dirty. Good morning, sir, I said. He answered in the native language. Uh, don't you speak English? I asked. French, he said. He tried speaking French to me and then spoke in the native language. I listened carefully, but I did not understand anything. I heard the names Adams, Case and Randall and the word poison. I also heard a native word that he repeated many times. When he left, I went home and asked Uma, What does fussy oki mean? Make dead, said Uma. Then Case poisoned Adams, I cried. Every man he know that, said Uma. Gave him white sand, bad sand. He got the bottle still. If he give you bottle, don't take it. I heard about this story on the other islands, so I decided to go to Randall's house to learn the truth. Listening Activity 1. I think you can have her. I'll talk to her mother and then bring her to Captain Randall's house for the marriage. 2. Every man know that gave him white sand. Bad sand. He got the bottle still. 3. I think I'll make a lot of money here. 4. Uma? But why does he want Uma? 5. Then Case poisoned Adams. Chapter 2. The Taboo When I got to Captain Randall's house, Case was standing on the veranda and Black Jack was in the store with customers. There are a lot of customers today, I said to Case. There haven't been any customers in three weeks, said Case. Three weeks, I said. Yes, three weeks, said Case angrily. Don't you believe me? I smiled and said, Do you know the French priest? Oh, Father Galouchet, said Case. Yes, I know him. I don't think he likes you or Captain Randall, I said. No, he doesn't, said Case. Because we don't go to church. 
Randall and Galuchet got angry and argued a lot about religion in the past. And when Adams died, they had a big fight. Now Galuchet says Randall poisoned Adams. It's a lot of nonsense," said Case, laughing. On Sunday, Uma asked me, "You go church today?" "No, of course not," I said. But then something strange happened. I went to take a walk in the village, and I heard some people singing in a church. I stopped outside the door and looked inside. The priest was a tall native man who was singing with the people. When he saw me, he immediately stopped and pointed at me. He stared at me and was terrified. I was frightened and ran home. I said nothing to Uma, but I was worried. I did not understand what was happening, and I did not like it. On Monday, no one came to my store. And I was angry. Uma, I said, it seems that coming to my store is taboo. I think yes, she said quietly. That evening, I went to talk to Case. Case, I said, I think I'm taboo here. That's impossible, he said. There are no taboos on this island. Have you talked to Randall? I don't like Randall. I said. Case laughed, took a lantern, and went to the village. He came back after a quarter of an hour and sat on the veranda steps. Well, am I taboo? I asked impatiently. Ah,、uh, yes, Wiltshire, something like that, he said. But don't worry, because I'll help you. Come here tomorrow morning at nine o'clock, and we'll talk to the chiefs of Falizan. They're afraid of me. Do you know why I'm taboo? I asked. No, but we'll find out tomorrow morning," said Case. The next day, we went to see the chiefs in their big house. A crowd of men, women, and children stood outside the big house. There were five chiefs, and they were dressed in white. One of them spoke to Case for a long time. What did he say? I asked. He wants to know your problem," said Case. "My problem," I said. "Tell him I'm a white man and I'm British. I came here to work, to sell things from my country, things these people don't have. But no one has come to my store yet, and I don't know why." Case translated my words, or he pretended to. The chiefs. Answered politely. When they stopped talking, I asked Case, "What's happening?" "I'll tell you outside," he said. "Well," I said impatiently. "I don't understand this, Wiltshire," said Case in a low voice. "But they don't like you. They won't go near you. They're afraid of you." "Afraid of me?" I cried. "But what are they afraid of?" They didn't tell me," said Case. "You know, I must be careful with these people. I work on this island too. I don't want any trouble with the natives." "I know you don't want any trouble," I said. "You've never come to my house. Why?" "You're right. I forgot to come," said Case. "I'm sorry, but I can't come now." "Are you afraid too?" I asked. Yes, I am," said Case. "But why? Why am I taboo for nothing?" "You're not taboo," he said. "But the natives don't want to go near you. You know, Wiltshire, the natives are free to go where they want. If they don't want to buy at your store, you can't force them." "Oh, now I understand!" I cried angrily. "None of these people will come to my store, but they'll go to yours." They'll trade their copra with you, and you'll have all of it, and I'll have none. I don't speak the native language, so I can't talk to these people, and they're afraid of me. This is a terrible situation, and you don't care. I can't do anything to help you," said Case coldly. Goodbye.
he said, and walked away. Listening Activity Did I ever tell you about the girl I met on the coast of Malabar? No? Well, I was in port for a few days when I met this beautiful, dark-eyed lady with a soft voice, and, uh, and I fell in love with her at first sight. We spent some time together, and she fell in love with me, or that's what she said. Anyway, we wanted to get married, but I was only there for two weeks or something like that. I had to go on another sailing trip. So we decided we would ask the missionary to marry us when I was next back, in about three months. Well, in those three months, I couldn't stop thinking about her, and they passed really slowly. But, um, when I got back to Malabar for the marriage, she said, um, she didn't want to get married. I was, you know, I felt awful. I said, I don't understand. We decided. We love each other. And she told me that it was impossible. Her people didn't like me because I was a stranger. The natives from where she came from didn't understand strangers wanting to marry them. No one would look at her or talk to her again. She would have something like a... like a... a taboo. Chapter 3 The Missionary when I got home, I was furious. Uma, I said nervously, you probably know what's happening. Why am I taboo? And if, if I'm not taboo, why are the natives afraid of me? She looked at me with her dark eyes and said, You know no? No, I don't. Case no tell you? No, I shouted. I ashamed, she said. I think you know. Case, he tell me you know. He tell me you know mind. Tell me you love me too much. Taboo belong me. Now I go away, so taboo go away too. Then you get too much copra. You like more better, I think. Goodbye. Wait, I cried. Case said nothing to me about your taboo. But I love you, Uma. We're happy together. Please don't go away. Uma started crying, and I put my arms around her. I realized I could not live without her. You're more important than Copra, I said softly, kissing her. We sat down and Uma told me her story. She and her mother came from another island about a year ago. The people in Falizar did not like them because they were strangers. Case helped them because he liked Uma. Then she met a young chief called Ione. He wanted to marry her, and she was happy. But then he left her and went away. She was very sad because she and her mother were alone and no one on the island talked to them or looked at them. They were taboo. It was terrible for them. Then I came and married her. I got up and started walking around the house. I felt terrible. Should I tell Uma the truth about the marriage? I thought. Suddenly, there was the sound of a boat, and Uma ran to the window. Mizi, she said excitedly. It was a missionary who often came to Falizar. I went out on the veranda and saw the missionary's boat. In the distance, I saw Case running to the boat. Case doesn't want me to talk to the missionary, I thought, as I went out of the house and walked towards the river. Get away from that boat, Case! I cried angrily. I do what I want on this island, said Case. I was very angry and hit him hard several times. He fell to the ground and had blood on his face. 
he knew that he was weaker than me, so he got up slowly and went home. I walked to the boat and saw a man dressed in white. Are you the missionary? I asked. Yes, I am, and you're probably the new trader. He answered. Yes, I'm Wiltshire. I said. And I don't particularly like missionaries. However, I need to talk to you about two important things. We can talk for an hour, and then I have to go to another village. He said. Good, I said. Come with me to my house. As we walked, he asked, "Why did you hit that man?" Soon you'll understand why, I said. When we got home, I showed the missionary the marriage certificate and told him about Black Jack. He was surprised and angry. I want to marry Uma in the right way, Mister Tarleton, I said seriously. Very well, he said. We need two witnesses. Call two men from my boat. They're outside. The two witnesses came in, and the missionary married us. And now I want to talk to you about another thing. I said. The missionary listened carefully to my story as he tried to eat the salty soup Uma made. She was a terrible cook, but a lovely wife. Well, he said at last, "You have a dangerous enemy. Case is an evil man. He is very clever, and the chiefs of the village believe him." He told everyone about Uma's taboo, and he poisoned Adams. Before Adams, there was a trader called Underhill. He became very ill, and couldn't move his body. He could only move one eye. Case told everyone he was a devil, and the natives believed him. Poor Underhill was buried alive. Case. Is the master of this island because people are afraid of him. Now he wants to get rid of you because he wants all of the copper. What can I do? I said. Only two people can help you: the French priest and the old chief Fayazo. I'm sorry, but I must go now. Goodbye and good luck to you and your wife. Said Mister Tarleton, leaving the house. Chapter Four. The Devil. A month passed, and no one came to my store. Farval had twenty coconut trees, but no one worked for her because she was taboo. So she, Uma, and I worked together and made copra. When I was not working with them, I went hunting in the woods, which were full of birds and other animals. One day, I was sitting near the woods and started talking to a native who spoke a little English. Is there a road that goes east? I asked. There was a road once, he answered. Does anyone go there? I asked.、Mm, no,、nope. he said nervously. Bad place. Too many devils. Devils? Yes, there are many devils there. He said, "Men who go there never come back." This native knows a lot about devils. I thought, maybe he knows about our taboo.、Uh, do you think Uma and I are devils? I asked. No, no, he said calmly. The devil lives in the woods. Suddenly, I saw Case walking on the beach across the small bay. He had a rifle in his hand, and he was going east. Look, I said to the native, Case is going to the woods in the east. He's not afraid. Case is a tiapolo, he said, and immediately disappeared in the woods. When I got home, I asked Uma, "What does tiapolo mean?" Devil," she said. I told Uma about the native I met in the woods. How can Case be a Tiapolo? I asked. 
She sat down and explained that Case belonged to the devil. He was like the devil's son. He always went to the woods in the east where the devils lived, and they did not hurt him. He spoke with the dead, and he even had a secret place in the woods. I was very surprised to hear this and said, Very well, I want to go and see Case's place. No, cried Uma. You no go. You never come back. She was suddenly worried and told me about six young men who went to the woods in the east and met six beautiful ladies. They talked and laughed with them, but that evening the young men became very ill and died. The people were sure that those beautiful ladies were devils. Do you believe that story? I asked. Yes, she said. Well, don't worry about me, because I won't talk to any beautiful ladies. The next morning, I took my rifle and knife and started going to the east. The woods were dark, and the trees were tall and close together. It was windy, and there were strange noises. At first, I was not scared, but I started thinking about Uma's story. Perhaps I am a coward, but I was soon scared. As I walked through the woods, I heard other strange sounds coming from the trees. I put my knife between my teeth and climbed up a tree. At the top, I saw a box with banjo strings across the top. When the wind blew, the banjo strings made a scary sound. You scared me once, Case, I said nervously as I climbed down the tree. But now I know your tricks. I continued walking through the woods and saw a long wall in front of me. Along the top of the wall there were big, ugly masks that shone in the dark. Some had hair and others had clothes that blew in the wind. They looked like scarecrows. Then I discovered a small cave with other scary masks. It looked like a strange place where people prayed to devils. Case is very clever, I thought. He brings the natives here at night and scares them with these masks, and they think they're devils. That's why they're afraid of him. Suddenly, I had an idea, and I left the woods. When I got home, I saw the young chief, Maya, sitting on my veranda. He was a rich man with thousands of coconut trees. Hello, Wilshire, he said, smiling. I want to trade my copra with you. I was surprised to hear this because Maya was going against Case, who wanted all the copra on the island. Maya was probably angry at Case because of a girl they both liked. I'm happy to trade with you, Maya, I said. He was my first customer. I could finally trade my coloured cloth, tools, tea and other things for his copra. I'm sorry you had to wait a long time for me, but I've been to Case's place in the woods, I told him. You went to Case's place? He asked, surprised. <laughs> yes, I said, laughing. And his place is a toy shop with a lot of scary masks. In England, children play with those things. I also told him about the banjo strings in the trees. He was amazed, but he seemed to believe me. That evening, I decided to put an end to Case and his devils. I took my rifle, knife, lantern, and dynamite and started walking to Case's place. When I got there, I destroyed all of the masks. Then I put dynamite in the cave and under the trees with the banjo strings. I began hearing some strange noises, and I immediately thought about Uma's story. I took my lantern and looked around. Suddenly, I saw a beautiful lady. A devil! I shouted. No shout, said a woman's voice. Uma, is that you? 
I cried. Yes, I come quick. Kay's here soon. Kay's? How do you know? Black Jack tell Farval. I did not know Uma was so brave. Her love for me made her do anything to help me, and this made me love her more. I must blow this place up now. Follow me. I lit the fuse, and Uma and I ran away and hid. Then there was a violent explosion and fire everywhere. Case's place was finally destroyed. The fire from the burning masks gave Case enough light to see me. He shot at me and hit my leg. The pain was terrible. Uma was hiding behind a tree, but when she heard me cry out, she ran to me. Case saw her and shot at her too. She fell to the ground. Case shot at my wife. Was she dead? As soon as he came near me, I pulled his foot and made him fall. We fought like two angry animals, and then I killed him with my knife, and that was the end of Tiapolo. Now the only thing I could think about was Uma. I slowly moved to her side and saw that she was still alive, but very scared. Her shoulder was hurt, but it was not serious. Mister Tarleton came for Case's funeral, and he was buried in the place where he kept his masks. Now that Case was dead, the copra business was mine. I never went back to England, and Uma and I had children and lived happily together.